storm surrounding me, let it break at your name. Still, call the sea to still, the rage in me to still every wave at your name. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus. shadows can't deny your name cannot be overcome your name is the light forever lifted high your name cannot be The ushers are distributing communion. And as we do this, we are, are reflecting on what Jesus has done for us through his death and through his resurrection. And we, uh, you, you've heard it called the, the Lord's Supper. 
Eucharist. We call it communion because it reminds us of a couple things. It reminds us, uh, one, that although we are so diverse and from so many different backgrounds, we are made into one family, not because of anything we have done, but because of what Jesus has done for us to bring us into a relationship with God. And that's the other part of it. We call it communion because we're reminded that through what Jesus has done, we have communion, relationship, nearness, oneness with God, our creator. Every time we celebrate communion, we are re being reminded that God is with us. There's this moment in the book of Acts that I just, I, I love. Paul is a prisoner. He's been arrested and, and, and they're taking him on a ship and they're taking him uh, to Rome. And as they go, it's getting into the stormy season and they're advised to not try to venture out. But they're like, ah, we can make it. And so they venture out uh, and all of a sudden they get caught in this storm. And the storm blows them off course. And for, for two weeks, for 14 days, they're just being blown off course. They have no idea where they are. And there's, they're caught in this storm. And because of the storm, there's, they, they're not even seeing the sun. Since they can't see the sun, they don't see the stars. For two weeks, they're just in darkness, being blown uh, by this wind. Have you ever felt that way before? But they're there in this storm. They don't know where they are. They know they're not where they want to be. They don't know if they're going to survive. They're throwing all of their rations overboard just to try to survive. Uh, some of them try to even escape, like we're going to go in a lifeboat, uh, and they're like, you're going to die if you do that. So they cut that off. So they're, 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 they've lost all hope. And Paul is in the middle of this. He, he calls everyone together. He's a prisoner. He, call, he takes the lead. He calls them together. He says, look, settle down. It's okay. We're going to be fine. Eat something. He says, listen, just, just take something to eat. We're going to be fine. And in, in, in the middle of this storm, it says this. It says, he took some bread. And in, there, he's in view of all of them. He says, he took some bread, and he gave thanks to God in front of them all. And then he broke it, and he began to eat. Now, he wasn't, he wasn't like in this moment saying, hey, let's do communion. But he was doing this very thing that all of those who were believers knew this is what Jesus had done. This is this reminder that God is with us. This is this reminder that we're not alone. This is a reminder that, that no matter what storm we're in, what circumstance we're in, God is with us. We are in relationship with him. We have hope because of him. I don't know what storm you're in. I don't know how long it's been since you've seen any light, any break in your situation. I don't know how far off course your life is. But in this moment, as we celebrate this, be reminded that God is with you in this storm. He's with you wherever you find yourself. And in this moment as we celebrate this, we remember that God who came to be among us, who died for us so that we could be with him and have relationship with him, he is with you here wherever you are in the situation that you're in. On the night that Jesus himself was betrayed. He took bread in his hands, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this, and keep doing this, so that you and all who come after will have a vivid reminder of me. And then after supper, the same way he took the cup, and he said, this cup the, it's my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many. Do this. Keep doing this so that you and all who come after will have a vivid reminder of me. Paul says every time we eat the bread, every time we drink the cup, we are proclaiming our faith in the Lord's death which was the ultimate expression of his faithfulness and love to us. And we are looking forward to that day when we will once again be face to face with him. Amen. So glad that you're here this morning. You may be seated.
Good morning and welcome to Capital Church. You know, the Gospel of Luke tells us the, about the very first ever Christmas Eve. Uh, and it says this. It says that suddenly a multitude of, hev- of, uh, of the heavenly army uh, appeared with the angel, praising God by saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth and favor to people. It's compelling, this Christmas claim, uh, that uh, with Jesus has come peace on earth. It's just a little bit difficult to see, right? Like, the Christmas story already, (laughs) it it has a lot in it that requires faith, right? Like like a a virgin giving birth, um, wise men traveling across the world chasing a star, uh, shepherds seeing a army of angels. God himself born in a barn. It's a lot. Can we agree? (laughs) But I think that this claim, peace on earth, that may be the hardest part to believe. Because, I mean, where? Like, just look around. War, terrorism, racism, human trafficking, gangs, poverty, Corporate corruption, politics. I mean, where on earth is peace? We as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we live within this tension. Because we don't deny that the world is a scary place. We don't deny uh, the, the, the terrifying, how terribly, terrifyingly unsettled the world is. We, we feel it. We face it. The things that concern our world concern us. Yet at the same time, we insist that there is peace to be found here on earth. Here, now, real and actual peace. Lasting peace, the kind that every single person is really ultimately searching for. And we believe that Jesus is the only true source of that peace. Uh, Throughout this Christmas season, we're going to do something different uh, throughout our series. And and we're going to talk about, uh, throughout this series, uh, the uh, real-life implications of the angel's claim. And and my hope is by the end of the series that you'll see that the angel wasn't overselling it. (laughs) Uh, We're going to talk about uh, the fact that peace on earth really can be found. And we're going to talk about why so often our search for peace turns up empty. And we're going to talk about what, practically, we can do in order to experience this real and actual peace on earth. And not just like in moments fleeting, but always. Before we dive into that today, uh, I just do want to say well done to all of you who are here uh, today. Uh, We believe that God wants your Sunday, uh, every one of them. And uh, we, we say it this way, that, that your presence reveals your priority. Uh, and so you being here today, uh, you, are, you are not only honoring God, but you're also inviting him to take the lead for your life this week. And I'll tell you, your life, <laughs> uh, your week uh, will be one thing or another based on who gets to lead your week. So well done for being here. I know also that not everyone can physically make it here. Some are out of town, some are not well, and, and I just want to, that's why I'm glad we're able to do this online, and so I just want to take a minute uh, and just to look in the camera and say, welcome all of you who are watching with us online, wherever you are, watching from our hearts are with you, and I'm so glad that we get to share this, and just, you know, your effort to be with us, even though you can't be with us, that's, that's a beautiful thing, and, uh, and we're glad that you're here. Would you just join me in welcoming those uh, who are watching with us online this morning? Hey, if you're here for the first time, uh, especially welcome. We're glad that you're here. There's a card in the seat back, and it's a connection card. We would love for you to fill that out. Uh, and if you'd fill that out and bring that to the Connect Center at the end of the service, we've got a gift for you. And I just want to send uh, a note just to, to let you know different ways that you can connect with Capital if you would like to do that. Uh, if you're here, your family, that's how we feel about it. So just make yourself at home. Uh, and speaking of home and family, uh, how about uh, the way uh, those who decorated have, uh, have decorated the house for Christmas? Doesn't that look great? Thank you. 
I don't even know all of who did that, but uh, you're incredible, whoever you are. So just take credit for it. So let's talk about uh, peace on earth. One of the most common ways that we typically go searching for peace on earth is by trying to um, by trying to remove the discomfort from our lives, right? Or, or by trying to remove ourselves from the discomfort. Like, if pain is here, well, then peace must be over there. And i just give you one uh, example. In, in post-World War II uh, America, uh, people who were searching for kind of a, 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 a more settled, more spacious, uh, more comfortable life, they began to leave the cities uh, and move outside of the cities, and, and, and the suburbs were born. Uh, and, and so people who were, who were just looking for kind of a, 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 a more relaxed uh, lifestyle uh, with more parking, uh, they, uh, they left the cities uh, and they went into, they went into uh, the suburbs. And they, they, the suburbs offered a couple things. It offered this settled life. It offered this safe, this, at least notion of, of, of safety. Uh, it, it, it offered certainty. I mean, certainty is comforting. And uh, uh, it offered like this, this, this little plot of peace on earth that you can own. And today, 75 years later, which is not very long when we think about human history, more than half of all Americans live in the suburbs. 175 million people uh, live in the suburbs. Uh, the suburbs are, they're like, a, like a, an evolutionary phenomenon in and of themselves because they, they were built and they exist and they thrive on this, I, this one idea, this idea that peace on earth can be acquired, that we can own it. And that idea is powerful and it has redefined the picture of what is an ideal life. Like the baseline of making it. To make it means to own your own house with a yard and a white picket fence with two cars, 2.5 kids, a dog, and a 401k. And if you get those things, you will have peace. If you can just, if I can just settle in suburbia, I will have peace. Of course, I will also need to uh, update those things and secure those things with security systems and property insurance and health insurance, car insurance, boat insurance, retirement insurance, disability insurance, life insurance, end-of-life insurance. But once I have those things, then I will have peace. You know what I mean? Little boxes is on the hillside. Little boxes made of ticky-tacky. Little boxes on the hillside. Little boxes all the same. There's a pink one, then the green one. And the blue ones and the yellow ones And they're all made out of ticky-tacky And they all look just the same And the people in the houses all Went to the university where they were Put in boxes and they came out all the same And the doctors and the lawyers And business executives and the
exactly like that. Suburbia is a really great metaphor because it really works for everyone. I mean, no matter where you live, we all have our own version of suburbia. Like your suburbia uh, is that formula that you have created uh, that defines what is your ideal life. Uh, And so, you know, it's the boxes that we check, that we seek to check in our life. And so I will have peace once I can get a car, once I get my own Place. Once I get that degree or I get that career, uh, once I find that boyfriend or that girlfriend or that spouse, etc., etc., then I will have peace. Now, don't misunderstand. There's, there's nothing wrong with wanting to have these good things in our life. The problem comes when we mistake the certainty or the temporary brand of certainty that these things promise for real and actual peace on earth. Uh, Jesus once warned, your heart will always pursue what you value as your treasure. He's saying, listen, be careful, because what you possess will possess you. What you own will end up owning you if the value's in the wrong place. And that's not just, uh, it, it's, it's not just uh, money. Uh, he's saying, listen, only bank on things you can truly count on. So let me ask you, have you had something unexpected come into your life and what you thought was settled suddenly became unsettled? Like, You finally got all the deck chairs arranged on your Titanic. And then came the iceberg. And your iceberg, I don't know, maybe it was a diagnosis or an accident or a market crash or a fire or a death. Maybe yours was a breakup, a divorce, a lost job. Maybe just someone else changed their minds or changed their plans. See, the thing is, when the disruption of uncertainty comes into our life, if we are mistaking certainty for peace on earth, then it will feel like all is lost when the unexpected comes into our life. What do you count on? Count on one thing The same God who never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who never late Is working all things out You're working all things out Yes, I will lift you high
Gospel of Luke tells us that God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, the virgin, and the virgin's name was Mary. This was an odd strategy uh, for, deem- for redeeming the world. Uh, Nazareth was just a small Jewish town about four miles outside of the urban center, the city, uh, a place called Sepphoris. Sepphoris was a, was a wealthy uh, Gentile city. It was heavily influenced by uh, Greek culture. And uh, it, 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 was, it was because of that, it was, it was certainly filled with all kinds of, um, all kinds of uh, melting pot of ideas uh, and, um, and, and pagan religions, uh, as well as, as, as um, um, I lost my thought. Sorry. You're a couple slides ahead, and it just, yeah, thank you. Uh, as well uh, as, uh, as, as uh, pagan religions, uh, and, and uh, man, let's just go move on from there. Pagan religions. Uh, so because of that, it was a very difficult place uh, to, to raise a Jewish family uh, in a Gentile city that was, that was, uh, was kind of like that. And so uh, these towns were built all around the area uh, that were places where uh, Jewish families could go and they were built their Jewish towns. They were basically suburbs before there were suburbs. Uh, and they were places where uh, people can go and kind of escape and be protected from uh, the, uh, the, the influences of the outside world. Uh, and so be- because of that, uh, they, were, they were guarded. In fact, uh, the, the town of Nazareth, it means guarded. Uh, and so uh, life there was very predictable, intentionally predictable. And so the only change were things like seasons. You know, night would turn into day and, and uh, you know, sowing season would turn into reaping season. And there were holy days and there were annual festivals. And it was all uh, very much on the, the, the cycle of life and it was predictable and it was safe, and it was certain, and certainty is comforting. And Mary and Joseph, they had their life all squared away, and things were, uh, all they were settled in their suburbia, uh, you know, until this. And uh, Joseph, uh, of course, Mary, you know, she had quite a surprising and a, and a significant role to play, but I think of, of anyone whose the rug was really pulled out from underneath them, uh, it was Joseph. I mean, Joseph was a, was a stand-up dude, right? Like Joseph, he, uh, he, he was, a, he was a, a hard worker. He had worked in a business that his father had passed down, that his grandfather had passed down to him. And by this point in his life, Joseph would have been, uh, he would have been in charge of that business, that family business. He was a craftsman, a, a carpenter. And in that time and place, uh, like the, 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 the man's dream life uh, would have been uh, to to uh, to own his own business, and to uh, you know to to have his his own family, uh, to have a, a wife, and to have many sons, uh, none of whom could walk on water, uh, and to have uh, to to ha- to have a, a family home and to raise this family in in the hometown, a- and Joseph he had he had basically almost checked all those boxes. He had the town. And he had the home and he had the business. Uh, And the Gospel of Matthew tells us that he had even uh, picked out uh, his wife as well. But, Matthew says, before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I can only imagine what was going through Joseph's mind as she lays out that story to him. Uh, And so Joseph uh, you know, to whom she was married, uh, to who she was engaged. He was a good man. And uh, she did not, did not want to disgrace her publicly, and so he, uh, he had decided to break the engagement quietly. Now, I, I feel like there, there, there was probably still a fight that happened between them, right? Like, it doesn't say there was a fight, but I feel like there was probably a fight, and it probably ended with Joseph storming out, saying something like, I wouldn't marry you now, unless the angel of the Lord appeared to me and told me to, right? And, and I think that because the next line is that uh, after Joseph considered this, the angel of the Lord appeared to him uh, in a dream. Uh, and so Joseph, son of David, uh, listen, don't be afraid to take Mary uh, as your wife. Like what she's telling you is true. The child that was conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And you're to give him the name Jesus 
and he will save his people from their sins. And so Joseph, he woke up from that dream, and he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him to do. He took Mary home uh, to be his wife. See, Joseph, he was settled. His, his life was settled. He was settled in his own suburbia. He had almost all of the boxes checked in his life. Mary was like the one missing piece. But then this ideal life that he had, that he had carved out for himself, uh, it all suddenly became unsettled. And his first instinct to do, right, his first instinct is to try to minimize uh, the disruption and, uh, and to, uh, to run from that, un, that, 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 that discomfort, which is that's our instinct too. But God had a different plan for him in mind. God was unfolding his own strategy to redeem the whole world. And he was inviting Joseph to embrace uncertainty and to become a part of something truly extraordinary.
Gospel of Matthew tells us about this extraordinary story that Joseph was being invited into. Uh, it says in Matthew chapter 1 that years and years ago, Isaiah, a, a prophet of Israel, foretold the story of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. That a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and his name will be Emmanuel, which is a Hebrew name that means God with us. Jesus is God himself became human, to dwell among us, to make himself known to us, to liberate us from the slavery to evil and to sin and to death. And God invited Joseph to be a part of this epic story. But in order to do that, he would have to lay down his own plans for his life. Here's what I hope that you will take away from today, that there is peace to be found, but it's not in the absence of uncertainty. It's in the acceptance of God's strategy. You know what's wild? That just months after this visit from the angel, uh, the emperor of Rome ordered that a census be taken of the entire Roman Empire, which meant that Joseph was going to have to pack up his business and pack up his home and move to Bethlehem and wait because there was no process, uh, there was no process for something this massive uh, that would happen quickly. Uh, in other words, uh, his settled was going to become unsettled regardless of whether or not he had obeyed God. You probably know this already from your own experiences. That no matter how hard we try to remove all the uncertainties of life, no matter how hard we try to settle the questions and take control uh, of the way everything works and check all the boxes, it's impossible. It's like grasping water. Because if it's not an angel uh, telling you to do something incredible, it's, a, it's an emperor uh, telling you to do what he's telling you to do, uh, or something else that comes into life that disrupts your plan. And in those moments... The difference between inner peace and inner turmoil is everything to do with what or who you're counting on. But peace is not found in the absence of uncertainty. It is found, however, in the acceptance of God's strategy. God would later on tell Joseph uh, that he needed to flee uh, Bethlehem and go to Egypt because Herod was trying to kill uh, his son. So he would go and he would, he would flee to, to Egypt and live there uh, for, for a amount of time as a, living as a foreigner in this uh, land that he was unfamiliar with. Uh, none of that was a part of Joseph's plan. But Joseph had found peace, inner peace not in the absence of uncertainty, but in his acceptance of God's strategy. Well, how can you and I have that same inner peace and do that same thing? Uh, I think two things. Number one uh, is that we need to take the next step that God is showing you. Take the next step that God is showing you. Notice that in this story, the angel does not tell Joseph the whole story, right? He doesn't say anything about the census. He doesn't say anything about Herod trying to, wanting to kill the baby. He doesn't say anything about a midnight flee into Egypt. He just says, Joseph, Mary, Mary. Uh, we don't have uh, a single quote from Joseph. I think that's interesting too. There's not a single quote from Joseph to know what was going on in his mind through this. Joseph has no lines in this play. All we have is this. It says that Joseph did what the angel of the Lord commanded him to do. All we have are a record of his actions, that he took Mary home, that he gave him the name Jesus, that he got up and took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt. He got up and he took the child and mother and he went to the land of Israel. He withdrew to the district of Galilee. He went and he lived in a town called Nazareth. Joseph's story is like a travel journal. Egypt, Israel, Galilee, Nazareth. For fun, because these are the kind of things I do for fun, I looked it up. And according to Google Maps, to make that trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem and then to Egypt, and I just went to the border, just to the border of Egypt, 
Uh, and then back into Israel and out to Galilee and then back to Nazareth was uh, 873 kilometers, which doesn't mean anything to me, so I put it into a, uh, uh, a converter program, and it comes out to approximately 1,145,669 steps. That'll spin your watch a little bit, won't it? <laughs> How do we know that Joseph found inner peace? in accepting God's strategy for his life? 1,145,669 steps of obedience. But why do we know Joseph's name or his extraordinary story at all? Because he married Mary. You see, had Joseph not taken the first step, he wouldn't have discovered all that God had for him. We'd still have the story of Jesus. Jesus still would have been born to earth and survived Herod's attacks. He still would have lived and died for our sins and rose from the dead. But Joseph would not have been a part of that story. See, extraordinary stories, they always unfold one small God-led step at a time. Let's just just be straight, right? Like, I don't know what your what God is showing you right now, what step it is that you uh, have in front of you to take. But if you don't take that step that's in front of you now, you will never see all that God wants to unfold in your life. So what does it take? How do we get the courage to take that step into that kind of uncertainty? Well, we have to trust that God is with us. Famously, uh, David, he, he wrote this. He said, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you, Lord, are with me. He was reminding his own soul that peace is found not in the absence of uncertainty, but in the acceptance of God's strategy. Maybe the unexpected has brought a certain kind of uncertainty to your life and you're struggling to find peace on earth because of it listen the answer is not in minimizing the disruption it's not in running away from the uncomfortable it's in taking the next step that god is showing you to take and trusting that as you take that step he is with you. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing a new song today, new to us. And as we sing this song, can you make this your statement of faith over that uncertain situation that you're living through? Will you make this the statement of faith within that uncertain storm? Would you in this moment remind your soul that you are not alone? There's a grace when my heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between What I used to be in this reckoning I know I would never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me, there was another in the waters, holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding for how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears the burden, where another died for me. There was another in the fire. Dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore 
Should I fall in the space between Where we need to be In this reckoning Either way I will bow to the things of this world And I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the waters Holding back the seas And should I ever need reminding What power set me free There is a grave that holds nobody no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come on, sit and dream of the things and see in this reckoning. I know I will never be You know, the Apostle Paul, it was after he had been following Jesus for many years, after he had, <laughs> he had gone through so many uncertainties, was almost constantly living in that place of disruption and un discomfort and uncertainty. He said this. He said, look, this is what I've seen again and again. This is what I'm certain of. And that's not just an empty Platitude. Paul was saying, look, this is what I have seen. That in the midst of any uncertainty, these two things are certain. That God is present. And that he has a strategy for bringing good into this world. And that he wants to do that through his people. Through those who love him. 
those who have answered that call to discover their purpose in Him. Listen, for the uncertainty that you are facing right now, there is peace to be found. And it's in accepting that God has a strategy for this. And that even this thing that you are in right now is in somehow part of a story that he is working out. That he is going to bring good out of that and into that. And he's going to bring that into your life. Listen, being a part and saying, God, I'm going to take that next step. It may not be convenient, but it is for your good. Your part in the story, it may not be easy, but it is filled with purpose. What is the next step that God has put in front of you? He won't show you all the way down the road, but he's showing you what the next step is. Would you bow your heads with me? Listen, you know what that is. I don't know your story. I don't know what that is for you. But if you would like to know that you're not alone, if you say, listen, I need the courage to take that next step that God is showing me, our pastors, our elders, and our, and, and, and our, our spiritual coaches, they're going to be up front here at the end of service, and they want to pray with you and help you pray through that. The next step that God is showing you may be the first and most important step that you, that you can ever take with God, and that's to come into a relationship with Him. God's desire for every one of us is that we would take the first step by turning away from a life of, of self-sufficiency, a life of our, of our unbelief, and that we would step to him by putting our faith and our trust in Jesus. The New Testament tells us how. It says, if you will declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, meaning Jesus is the rightful leader of my life. I've been leading my own life, but Jesus is the rightful leader of my life. And you will believe in your heart that God did, in fact, raise him from the dead. That he came and he died for my sins, but he is not dead. He rose from the dead so that I can have a new relationship with God. If you declare that, if you believe that, you will be saved. In just says, saved. Saved from a life disconnected from God. Saved from a life of going in the wrong direction. Saved from eternity, separated from Him. As if you will, if you this morning want to say yes to Jesus, you say, listen, I want to take that first step into a relationship with God or back into a relationship with God. I want to get myself right with God today. Then I just want to lead you in a simple prayer uh, that will put you in that position, in that right position with God. This morning, if you would say, listen, I, I need to get, I need to take that first step. I need to get right with God. Or, or you would say, listen, I need to get back. I need to fix my relationship with God. Would you just slip up your hand? I just want to pray for you. Yes. Anyone else, you ready to put your trust in Jesus? Yes. Lord, you see the hands. You see these hearts. We're saying yes to you. Yes, Jesus, we believe in our hearts that you died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins and that you rose from the dead uh, to, to, to give us a new relationship with you. Lord, we are acknowledging that you are the rightful leader of our lives. We invite you into our lives and we ask you to help us to follow after you. Thank you for being God with us, for rescuing us and loving us and leading us. We love you. We thank you for your love for us. Amen. You prayed that prayer this morning. You took a step of commitment or recommitment with Jesus. I would love to know about that. That card that's in your seat, you can fill that out. And if you fill that out and bring that to the Connect Center or put it at the giving stations, uh, we will. I'll follow up with you and just let you know about some next steps that you can take in your spiritual journey. Hey, thank you so much for coming out and, and for sharing Sunday. Uh, today uh, together. 
we have a couple things just to, just to keep in mind. One is that the growth plan is step one today. And it's all about moving from inside this room to alongside the mission with Capital Church. And that's going to start at 1230. And you can see signs when you go out here where that is. It's still not too late to join one of our life-giving small groups. And so there's a board back there you can check out. Our giving stations are also in the back. Uh, and you can, you can give online. You can give there. Uh, we thank you for the ways that you are partnering with us to make a difference locally and around the world uh, through your tithes and through your offerings. Come back next week for part two of our Searching for Peace series. Uh, we would uh, love to have you here. And listen, if you would like to prayer, our elders and our, and our spiritual coaches are going to come forward uh, right now. They're going to be available for you uh, to pray. May the love of God, may the grace of Jesus, and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God bless you. The Lord be with you.